Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. All right, let's welcome everybody out today to episode 341 of I Am Salt Lake podcast. My name's Chris. And my name's Chrissy. Hey, we're, of course, recording today out of our awesome podcast studio at Access Coworking Space, right in the heart of downtown Salt Lake City, right on the corner of 200 West, 200 South. Stop on by sometime. This place is awesome. And if this is your first time listening to this show, you might be wondering what we're doing here. Chris and I are here to talk to the people of Salt Lake, the musicians, the artists, the business owners, restaurant owners, anyone who has a cool story and makes things. We want to get to know the people behind the cool things. Like today on the podcast, we get the opportunity to sit down and have a great conversation with Mike Hamill. Mike Hamill, you might be wondering who he is. We had a fun conversation with him. He's actually a local spoken word artist, poet, and actor. And in this conversation that we're going to play in a few minutes, we get to find out his story and about his spoken word album and what brought him to Utah. And we even get to find out what it was like to be an actor in the cult classic movie, Troll 2. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, but before we jump into that interview, let's give some love to our sponsors for this episode. The Delicious Five Wives Vodka. We love these guys. The Salt Lake Barber Company. This is where I go to get my hair cut. And Market Source Real Estate. We're going to be telling you more about them a little bit later on in the podcast, but really quick, it is farmer's market season, and I know a lot of listeners, a lot of you guys listening might have just moved to Utah, right? Go check this out. This is going on every Saturday up until October 20th, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's happening at Historic Pioneer Park. This is free to get into. It seems like a big like street fair event takes up that whole block. It's full of produce and, and local artisans and making crafts and, and, and they're selling their art. And it's a really cool place to actually bring kids. Like I'm really excited to bring Lucy there. There's always a guy in the middle who has these huge bubble things. Oh, so yeah. you can bring it, kids, they can play in the bubbles. There's magicians music. and balloon artists. So make sure to uh, plan it into your schedule. And we're actually going to be there August 11th. We're going to have a booth set up. There's an I Am Salt Lake booth where we're going to have merch, uh, an opportunity to come and say hello to us. And we might even be doing some some podcast recording. So make sure to stop by August 11th. Say hello. And, and give me a free high five. <laughs> give Chrissy a free high five. All right. Let's get into that conversation we had with Mike Hamill when he came over to our podcast studio and shared his story. Enjoy. your childhood smell like do you remember your childhood at all to dirt go, dirt huh did you, did you play a lot in the dirt is that kind of Qu quite a bit my parents wouldn't let me in the house too much <laughs> <laughs> now did you grow did you grow up here in utah or no i grew up in ohio zanesville ohio zanesville like kind of give the reference to that is that near, it's near cleveland 50 miles or, or east columbus. of columbus columbus okay we're well, famous for two things in zanesville ohio one we had the only y bridge in the world a bridge in the shape of a Y that crosses over two rivers. And the other thing, uh, about, I think it's been six, seven years now, there's, what, 100 Bengal tigers in the world. And uh, some guy in Zanesville had, like, 15 of them. And he had As lions pets? and tigers and bears on his property. Oh, my. About a mile from a neighborhood. And at dusk, he decided, you know what? I think I'm going to turn all these animals loose and <gasps> kill myself. So he set 109 animals Lions, tigers, and bears loose on the community. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And, and, how, Hannah, and how old were you during this time? Oh, this just happened about, like five, six years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. And Jack Hanna from the Columbus Zoo came down. They called him, and he wanted to try to save the animals, but it was dark, and yeah. he couldn't, you know, he wanted to tranquilize, tranquilize them and uh, save them, but you couldn't, you know, it was dark, so you couldn't see. So you couldn't say, hey, Phil, shoot that tiger in that brush over there, then go see if you hit them. Yeah. yeah. So they ended up only saving, I think, one bear and uh, uh, one uh, cougar out of the 109 animals. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. That's my wow. hometown. So you just make you still, you proud. You know? <laughs> do you still keep in touch? I mean, you still have family there and everything. Oh, yeah. I still have family in the area. I've well, been so what, back there for quite what a while. brought you to Utah, man? What to, to, well, to Park got, Cities where you reside now? Well, I got out of the Air Force in 1981, was hitchhiking around the country, and came out to see a buddy up at Hill Air Force Base, about up in Ogden, 
what is it, about 50 miles from here. And uh, told him I wanted to spend the winter in a ski resort. So he dumped me off in Park City. And when I got out of the car, I broke my thumb and I could never hitchhike again. So I got stuck. <laughs> now you're stuck. <laughs> so you, so how long ago was that, did you say? That was in 1981. 1981. Now, have you always, like, are you from a musical family or when did that I'm not, whole- I know, I know. It's funny. I've got a CD. I, I know nothing about music. I'm a writer. What got you poet. interested in creating an album? Well, I was dating a lady, I forget when it was, in the 90s some, some at some point. And um, I was writing all these poems about my daughter. And she said, hey, you ought to put those in the book. And I thought, well, I don't know about a book, but I'd always wanted to do, do a CD. You remember Rod McLuhan from the 60s and 70s? The he, name sounds familiar. He was a poet who played guitar and recited his poetry to guitar music. Okay. Real famous. Uh Sold like 20 million albums, and then he re- retired and moved to Montana, never to be heard from again. But I'd always wanted to try something like that. So she got me thinking, well, maybe not a book, but uh, maybe a CD. And then I got together with Rich Wyman, a piano player up in Park City, and uh, told him what I wanted to do. And he, we met one afternoon in a rehearsal space he had. He said, well, what are you thinking about this piece? And I, I go, um well, you know, I think some saxophone. I want this to be a, set the mood for the whole CD. Some nice sax, some keyboards. And he'd go, oh, something like this? Yeah, yeah, something like that. And we went through all the pieces. And then we met over at uh, the following Monday at uh, uh, River Ranch Studios in Woodland, Utah, which was owned by Ricky Martin, Dean Martin's son. We recorded my voice on Monday and Tuesday. And then he told me, get the hell out of here. I don't want to see you. Don't call me. Don't bug me. And tell, I'll tell you when I'm done. <laughs> uh, four days later... He called me up and said, got it finished. Come on over and listen to it. And wow. It's just incredible what he did in four days. So is yeah. this this is your only CD then that you have, yes. right? And this is called- I've got other releases, but that's my only CD. Okay. I've just released a, a piece about Alzheimer's, a family fighting Alzheimer's called It's Okay. And then last year, I released a piece called Don't Worry Dad for Memorial Day. And it got played on uh, 97.1, the number one radio station in Las Vegas. Really? Yeah. How'd you pull that off? Well, I work at, as a fine dining server at night, and I was waiting on a table one night, and we just hit it off and we were talking. They were wine drinkers. We were talking about wine. Found out that one of the couples had children, so I gave him a copy of my CD, and he was looking it over, and he said, well, you know what? You got a CD. You know what I have? And I go, no, oh, I have no idea what you have. Wait, what do you have? <laughs> he goes, well, I've got about 13 radio stations. And he said, I'm going to try to help you out here. So uh, when I released my Memorial Day piece, I sent it to him, and he got it put on one of his stations. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. How'd that make you feel? Well, pretty incredible. You know, uh, not too often a unknown artist gets played on a number one station in a, in a major market, yeah. let alone one that doesn't sing. All I do is spoken word. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing to he did that for me. So you play zero musical instruments. And I play no instruments. I just write. And I, I'm a, a, a jazz, the music on the CD is mostly jazz music. So I call myself a jazz spoken word artist. You know what? Let's actually, I'm going to stitch one of these songs in. Let's go ahead and play a song now Okay. for, for our listeners. We mm-hmm. said you wanted to play two songs here from this. Maybe we can even glow, go out with one. We can. Uh, Absolutely. We can. Or we let's can play, play a, a, year, a year gone by. It's about the first year of a child's life okay so we'll play that we'll come back and chat with uh, mike some more here and uh, we got all kinds of good stuff to chat about so hang tight we'll be back after we play this song has it really been a year gone by watching the flame of the single candle on your cake as you try i think back on a year gone by. From here, it's a girl. They're holding you in my arms. I don't know who's grown more, you or I. I remember when your eyes first opened, wondering what it was you saw. First time you smiled, I was wrapped around your finger. A year gone by of late night feedings, 
when I laid you to your mother's breast. The times you needed changed. The times you needed to be held. The times you simply slept. I remember them all through the blur of the year gone by. I remember when you first left your mother's breast. When you first tried to touch, you knew not what. The first time you giggled. Your shock when you first rolled over. How quickly you learned to crawl and explore. So many things you did, I remember. But my fondest memory of the year gone by is how I've learned to give love and set aside myself for someone much more special than I. Has it really been a year gone by? I guess since we played a yeah, song, tell, we probably tell, should tell people what the CD is about. Yeah, t- tell, uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about a father's love letters. Yeah, it's about the first nine years of a father-child relationship. I believe that as humans, one of the most important things we can do is be parents. Because after all, if there were no parents, the three of us wouldn't be here today, right? Yeah. Sure. And I think that one of the most important uh, aspects of being a parent can be summed up in two words, being there. And that's what this CD is about. It's being there as a father. Your child only gr- learns how to walk once, talk once, ride a bike once. Be there for those times. Your children care more about you being there instead of uh, how much money you make. I don't know, that's man. Like, I've met some kids that they care about well, what their parents make, man. That, that's I'm true. just kidding. Well, I mean, that's, true. that's true in some Trying to add a little humor. I should, I should say the majority of kids. Now, do you, do you, do you have kids, Mike? I have the one daughter. The yeah. one daughter? Yes. I actually just became a, a father to a little baby girl myself 10 oh, months ago tomorrow ten. Yeah, is her 10-month okay. birthday. Thanks. Well, this CD will give you a good preview of what you got to look forward to. So, I mean, we'll talk about it towards the end, too, but where can people go listen to your music, buy your music, buy you know, the CD? Even? At the moment, um, you can listen to it on ReverbNation.com forward slash Mike Hamill. Okay. You can also buy it there, but... I would prefer you just shoot me an email at my email address because I've been on Reverb Nation for six years and I've got several hundred sales and I think I've got $13 in royalties. Yeah. <laughs> Reverb Nation. It's a good place to get your music out. Royalties not, not a good place best. to sell it. What is your email address here, Will? The T H E Mike Hamill at gmail.com. Okay. And I'll, again, I'll put that at I am salt lake.com with this episode. So if people are driving, you didn't get that. Go ahead and, Head on over to our website, get it there, and shoot Mike. I mean, Mike's a nice guy too, just to say hello and say, "Hey, yeah. I heard you on yeah, I Am Salt Lake." So this this uh, CD has thirteen songs. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a full length uh, deal. I don't know. I'm trying to think of anything more to talk about. Yeah, is there? Well, I am trying you... to turn the CD. Oh, oh yeah. Maybe you're going to bring it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh I, well, I'm just going to interrupt you and tell you what you were about to say. Okay. You go were ahead. telling us that you wanted to get this turned into a Broadway show. Yes. Oh I'm, yeah. I'm working on uh, getting that turned into a Broadway show. I just did a show down at Draper Amphitheater, and that went really well. That was step one. Of when the, how, of when the was that? Was that recently? Yes, June fifteenth. Okay, so about a month Pretty ago. Yeah, yeah. Did you actually write a screenplay? A stage play, yeah. It's funny, when I got to Park City, I didn't know anybody, and I'd always wanted to try acting, so I got a uh, part in a one-act play called Hello Out There, which was an American classic. And as I'm going through the rehearsals, I thought, hell, I can write something like this. I didn't think it was all that great myself, but I wrote a stage play, and I took it to the theater director. He said, oh, my God, how long have you been in town? I said, oh, about two months, because I've been trying for 10 years to get somebody to write a stage play for me. Of course, I'll put it on for you. So we put that one on, got good reviews, and ended up doing two or three more. So I actually wrote the first uh, live stage plays ever performed in Park City. Oh, wow. And That's then awesome. I've got a pretty extensive uh, play for uh, a Father's Love Letters. For instance, there's a piece on here talking about teaching a child how to ride a bike. And the way I would perform that in the Broadway show is I'd have an acrobat come wobbling out on a bicycle on the stage like they're trying to learn how to ride a bike. 
ride right off the stage, out over the audience, back over the audience, across the stage, right through the video screen uh, on the stage. And on the video screen, you'd see a, see a child and father learn how to ride a bike. And then the child would start wobbling as he's learned how, and then they let go and start riding with no hands and morphing an eagle. And the eagle would fly away from the camera, make a U-turn, fly right into the camera like it just flew off the stage. And from above the video screen, I'd have a live eagle released and come down and land on my arm. Wow, that would be so. It's a pretty pretty intense really show. Intense. Yeah, a lot yeah. of lot of rigging, a lot of lot of special effects, and like a really well trained eagle. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. hopefully. So you mentioned acting, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're going to bounce. We'll, we'll get back to your music. Oh, here. I can I, see where this is going. <laughs> no, no, well, no, 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 no. I mean, it doesn't need to go. Any, I mean, I just want to talk a little bit about your acting here. That's all right. Go so, ahead. So, you, I mean, acting, singing, music, the whole mm-hmm. nine yards. You, you like to be in front of people. Right, like you like to, you like, yeah. you like I to get I out, I, and I guess and, I'm a bit of a narcissist or no, I mean, artist. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to use that word, yeah. narcissist. Yeah, no. I mean that. That do you like, yeah. like singing in front of people, music, or do you like the acting? I like performing or, original material. So whatever it is, I don't like going to a theater and seeing the two thousand five hundred and twenty ninth production of Peter Pan. You know, I got nothing against it. the writers of Peter Pan, nothing against Neil Simon, but I like original uh, material. Do you go? So. Do you prefer to go watch original material? Oh yeah, and absolutely. also be yeah. in it. Yeah, absolutely. I prefer watching up and coming artists trying to make it. I appreciate the Rolling Stones. I appreciate Neil Neil Simon, the Beatles, and all that. But they've had their time, and they, mm-hmm. you know they were very successful. And God bless them for that. They they worked hard and they earned. It. Now it's time to. Give other people a shot. Yeah, I love that. I love that you're, you know, really paying attention to up and coming people or people who are just getting started. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I'd rather go to pay $20 to see an original show than another performance by the Stones or, you know, that's nothing against the Stones. Right. It's just that I've seen them. Very grateful I got an opportunity to see them. I I think everybody should go see all the uh, classic artists. Right. Um, then go check out other stuff too. Then go check out other yeah. stuff. Don't spend all your money on the stones. The stones are rich enough. There you go. <laughs> You've been in one movie. How many movies have you been in, Mike? No, oh, I've been in several, several what? commercials. And in fact, I was in a leather, leather I can't pronounce it, Le- Leather Man Tool commercial. Oh, oh Leatherman. Yeah. Leatherman. Like tool. the little uh, tools the little, that you carry on your yeah, on your belt. Yeah, exactly. Like a, like yeah. a man tool. The man and tool. I was the, I was the lead in that. And, and uh, it got played during the Super Bowl. I could see you carrying Bowl around Bowl. a Leatherman. You yeah. look like the kind of guy that would always yeah, have I, one on you. I played the leader of a motorcycle gang, and we pulled up. There was a young couple uh, on a scooter. The scooter had broken down. My gang pulls up, and they think that we're going to attack them or something. And this is a pretty rough-looking gang. And whip out the tool and flip it up in the air, and I fix their motorcycle, and I ride off into the girl. So, <laughs> so how did you get into? I mean, what got you into commercials? Then, like, yeah, I guess you just well, I signed up a little, for it, or I mean, well, I uh, had a job at a wine bar up in uh, Park City, and one of the uh, bartenders up there, his wife had a talent ag- agency, and uh, he hooked me up with his wife, and the first thing she sent me out on was that particular c- commercial. And then you worked in com- the commercial industry for a while? I went okay. Yeah. And, and then yeah. you built yourself up to troll too. Yeah. You were trying yeah. to skirt around this, Mike. You were trying to skirt around. Well, actually, despite troll two, I built myself up to that, to the commercial. Okay, so so Troll Two was before the commercial. Yeah, Troll Two was way before so what, the commercial. I gotta tell you though, it I'm has a great be honest, cult following. I don't, I don't think I've ever even seen Troll Two. We're I've gonna seen, watch it. I've seen, I've seen the it. first Troll, which you. was great. The first well, Troll not, was great. They're not related they have, though, yeah, right? They, nothing they, to do with each other. There's zero relation. Yeah. It was just. And I always tell people, don't ro- watch Troll Two alone and with a gun. Because first you want to shoot yourself, and then you want to shoot the TV. Okay. Why it is it god awful? Why is it so bad? Why is it so bad? Tell me, why is it so bad, Mike? Well, here's part of my part of I was I was the preacher in, in the uh, in the movie Preacher Bells, and here's part of my dialogue. It, it was about the smell of smoked sausages and the clusters of hemorrhoids they started. That was my dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> that was one one of my sermons. What year? The stink, the stink. Yeah, the stink of smoked sausages and that. 
the clusters of hemorrhoids that cause. Stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> what, what year did that come out? What, what? Oh, God, it came out in 1990, and the movie just won't die. It just, it just <laughs> won't go away. It got voted by IMDB, the International Movie Database, as the worst movie ever made. Ever made. And it deserves that title but it's one of the best worst movies ever made do you do you ever get recognized for this oh god all the time really well in fact one night at work uh, a guy rented out a room at the restaurant and uh, he's going to propose to his daughter i mean not his daughter oh hopefully not <laughs> sorry i think about my love letters uh proposed proposed to his fiance and he had it all set up and i walked out of the back as he walked into the room and he stopped and his jaw dropped and he goes, oh, my God, is it you? Is it you? And I go, oh, no, no, please not this. Please not. This. Are you the preacher from Troll 2? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and then he wanted your autograph. He and, uh, wanted my autograph. And after he proposed and, and she accepted, I went over to him. I go, hey, if you need a preacher, I know where you can get one cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Let's actually take a quick break. We need to play a message from our sponsors, but I want to still talk, talk about Troll 2. So hang tight. We'll play those messages and be right back. Hey, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by Five Wives Vodka. You know, when you're in Texas, drink Tito's. But when you're here in Utah, you drink Five Wives Vodka. So the next time you go to your local bar or you go to the state liquor store to pick up a bottle, Pick up a bottle of Five Wives Vodka. They actually have three different flavors. A lot of people only know about the original one. That's the only one I knew about for the longest time because that's the only one I was drinking. But there's three different flavors. Chrissy and I are going to tell you about them. They have the original Five Wives Vodka. I was telling you about this one. This one is made from Utah Mountain Spring Water. It's 100% distilled corn spirit and it's gluten free. That's, of course, what got me hooked on it. The spring is hidden in beautiful Ogden Canyon, which is inaccessible by vehicle, so the water is hiked out five gallons at a time. And Five Wives Sinful is a flavored vodka with a delicious cinnamon taste. It's not like other cinnamon products that give you that cinnamon candy taste and leaves that sugary feeling in your mouth. Sinful is like a morning cinnamon roll with only 76 calories per ounce. Then they have the Five Wives Heavenly, which when I discovered this one, I was like, oh my gosh, I've died and gone to heaven. No pun intended. This one has a delicious vanilla taste. It's Heavenly's rich, buttery vanilla flavor. It comes through without coating the taste buds with sugar, and this results in more flavor and less calories. Head on over to their website. This Okay, write this down, guys. Fivewivesvodka.com. Are you going to remember that? This is where you can find out more about them. You can find out like recipes and get some more information. There is also an app. This is good for our out-of-state listeners. If you go to bfspirits.com, this is for Big Fish Liquor, there's an app where you can download and get Five Wives Vodka delivered to your doorstep. I know, simple, easy, gotta love these guys. Fivewivesvodka.com, and of course, many thanks to Five Wives Vodka for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. All right, this episode of the podcast is also sponsored by the Salt Lake Barber Company. Full disclosure, this is where I go to get my haircut and beard trims. Isaac over there, my gosh, this guy is an amazing barber. If you guys want a good fade or good beard trim, go check him out. There's also, I mean, they got a bunch of other barbers there that are, do a great job as well. Not just Isaac, that's where I go though. 10 East, 800 South, right on the corner of 8th and Main in the Central 9th District. They have haircuts, beard trims, straight razor shaves. I have yet to try a straight razor shave. Maybe one of these days. I don't know if you guys are ready to see me without a beard, though. They are a true community barbershop. They're focused on providing the best work environment possible and allowing barbers to always provide the highest quality experience while in the chair. They take walk-ins. I know a lot of people are used to this whole idea where you just walk in and get a haircut, but they offer guaranteed appointments where you can book them online for a guaranteed appointment at saltlakebarberco.com. It's really easy. You select your barber. You select what you're going to get. You can schedule a time, and you know that is when you're going in for a haircut. I love that about getting a haircut. It's like, okay, I'm going in at 11 o'clock. Simple, easy. Like I said, they have haircuts, beard trims, straight razor shaves. They support local. They got t 
tons of local products in there. They have public coffee brewed daily in there. They have a wide variety of grooming products. They have a Ninja Turtles arcade game, and all the proceeds go to charity. <laughs> Again, go to saltlakebarberco.com. This is where you can book your haircut with a barber over there. Go check them out. Many thanks to the Salt Lake Barber Company for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. All right, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by Market Source Real Estate. If you're like me, you love the charm and character of older homes, and you need to contact our friends Monique and Jeremy Higginson of Market Source Real Estate. For the past 17 years, they've been specializing in helping people buy and sell homes in Sugar House as well as the whole Salt Lake City area. They have a background of flipping houses, and they've owned almost two dozen homes themselves, and they know all the ins and outs of older homes. If you're looking to sell your home, Market Source Real Estate specializes in helping sellers update or repair their homes to increase their value and make sellers more money. And if you're looking to buy an old home, they know exactly what to look for in older homes so you don't end up buying a money pit, which sucks. You can find their info at thinksaltlakecity.com today or call 801-810-6773. Again, that website is thinksaltlakecity.com. Their phone number is 801-810-6773. So if you're thinking to move to Salt Lake City or if you're looking to move outside Salt Lake City, check Market Source Real Estate out. And of course, many thanks to Market Source Real Estate for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Sorry, sorry to bring up Troll 2 here for That's you. That's all right. You know, yeah. uh, I'm not talking about being recognized. I was waiting on the band train at the restaurant. Their drummer looked at me and goes, God, I know you from somewhere. I go, really? Where do you know me from? And he, he said, don't tell me. Uh, are you an actor? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm an actor. <laughs> and he thought for a moment, he goes, you were in Troll 2, weren't you? And I go, oh, my God, the drummer of, of Train knows Troll 2. <laughs> See, you have so many genuine fans out there. You just need to get out and oh, brag about it. You know, they tried to get me for years, They, the uh, people in the movie. And the ones that did the documentary about it said, hey, you got to come to these showings. They wanted me to come to New York City for a show in a troll, too. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You want me to come to New York City where they actually view acting as an art form to admit that I was in this piece of shit movie? <laughs> they go, no, 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 you don't understand. People come in costume. They line up outside, down the street and around the block. Hundreds of people try and get into this thing. For, they, got, they dress up as like oh, yeah. the people. And in, I said, oh, no yeah. way. So they came to Salt Lake and they invited me down. And I said, well, I'll see. So I went down. I hit across the street from the Tower Theater in a restaurant to see if people actually came to this thing. And sure enough. You were just hiding out watching? So yeah. Was, sure. the, was <laughs> that awesome. filmed here in Utah? Yeah, then? in the, Heber and Morgan. The whole the whole movie? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And so the, the director, produ they all live here in Utah? Huh? No, that, it was an Italian film company. So how did, did you even mention, how did you get teamed up with that whole thing? Right? Well, my agent at the time, Mark McCarty, Susie McCarty, had me audition for it up in Park City. And I went in to audition, and none of the people there spoke English. And they had me do my part, and I did my part. Uh, it was for the preacher, and I did it like a Jimmy Swaggart. No, he is a fire and brimstone preacher from the past there. And, uh, and they loved after, it. After the audition, they they were shouting, going, nah, nah, pointing at their eyes. And uh, I thought they were saying they liked what they saw. And they offered me the part. I said, sure. What they were actually saying was, can you wear contacts? Oh, because <laughs> you I said, yes. On. And they said, you're hard. <laughs> <laughs> Could you wear contacts? No. It oh. took about a half hour to get the contacts in, into my eyes. So it was, it was a pretty big role then that you had in Troll 2, right? I mean, I yeah. should, I should have watched I'm, this. Is it on net? Is it on, is it on Netflix or anything? <laughs> I don't know. Well, for a long time, it was the number one horror movie on, on Netflix. It might be. To be honest, it was about mm, three years ago that I saw it. So and I'm who, trying to recollect. I, I probably have seen it. I mean, people, people that are listening to the podcast right now are like, Chris, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah, there's You've, lots of fans. Uh, oh, huge, like I was, yeah. Like I was saying, I went down and hit across the street, and sure enough, people lined up down the street and around the block to get in it, and they were all in costume. So did you go and, walk up and say hi to people and yeah, introduce yourself? Yeah, I was with somebody, and they said, well, let, you might as well go across. We're here. So yeah. I started walking across the street, and people somebody, just somebody saw me come across the street, and everybody just started going nuts. Oh, my God, it's the preacher. It's a preacher. 
That's and they so all cool. came out in the middle of the street and <laughs> asking for autographs. I was signing women's breasts. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, I go into this movie. Did you? I mean, I bet you it felt like a million bucks. Uh, well, I was thinking, you got to be kidding me. Over this piece of shit movie. <laughs> and I went in and watched the movie, and it was like being in a Great for Dead concert. They knew, People know every word of every line in the movie. They bring prop props. Uh, they know just when to throw the props in there. And it's just, it's just a fun time to see in a theater. Yeah. But like I say, don't watch it at home by yourself with a gun or you will want to shoot yourself <laughs> and then shoot the TV. Yeah, it's a horrible movie. So, do you, I mean, are you still like pursuing a movie career, an acting career? Are you still trying to get out there? Well, yeah, not, not so much anymore. You know, it's, uh, the one thing, especially in Salt Lake, there's two reasons. One, the um, management companies here, all they know how to do is do what's called a buyout. It's like that commercial that got aired at the Super Bowl and it got aired worldwide. They did a buyout on that, which means for X amount of dollars, that's all you get. So for a worldwide commercial that was played during the Super Bowl, I got $500. Hmm. Now, if that was a LA agent, that would have been worth You'd got six a percentage figures. every time it yeah, was played, yeah. probably. Yeah. So hmm. that's one reason. And second reason is just got tired of hearing all these film companies come in from L.A. and say, oh, man, that's the best audition we've seen all week. You're great. You're really good. and Got so much talent. We really like you. And then call the uh, uh, agent and say, hey, well, did they hire me for the movie? And they go, no, they decided to go with somebody from L.A. Oh. So, I mean, that, that would hurt you a little bit, stab you in the back, kind of, like, not a yeah, little, well, little pain. You know, well, yeah, L.A. I mean, production companies just think that the only actors in the world are from L.A. Yeah, exactly. They don't realize. Not all the talent is located in L.A. Yeah, and they don't realize that some of the talent they bring from L.A. are originally from Utah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, I mean, have you thought about, like, ditching Utah and just heading off to L.A.? Well, oh, Hollywood a little. L.A. is just not for me. I went out there and stayed in Eric Morris' uh, studio for couple of weeks. Eric Morris is a, a famous um, acting coach, well known back in the eighties. And uh, he coached everybody from Johnny Depp to Cliff Osmond to quite a few people. It's just, just wasn't for me. Just a mess out jam. there. And Park yeah. City is really nice. Yeah. You know, I would yeah. probably stay yeah. there too. So now I'm, I'm more concentrated on the father's love letters, trying to get that going. I think it's got a really strong message. I, good family message now yeah. now one thing we didn't i i just thought of that we didn't ask is this self-produced then did you did you oh yeah self-produce this yeah, yeah and so you you got like a studio probably up in park city to record it all in or, yeah, or the, the, River, the guy River the guy Ranch. the guy yeah, dean martin so. dean martin gosh yeah. you mentioned that at the beginning sorry yeah, that whole cd cost me five grand to, wow. to do when you listen to it to think that rich wyman did all that music in four days is pretty that's amazing. incredible yeah well, Johnny Lightfoot plays on the CD, too. Oh, from Air Supply. Yeah. From yeah, Air he's Supply. from Utah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we need to get him on the podcast. In fact, he uh, he played on the CD before he was with Air Supply, and I always joke around that Air Supply stole my bass player. <laughs> and one day, I'm going to steal him back. So when did you actually start creating the CD? <laughs> well, the very first piece was actually written before I even had a child. It was written for when I was in the Air Force in 1977, stationed in Germany, and a friend of mine had a baby girl. And then I wrote that first piece about that. And then I started writing the rest of them after I had my own child. And so this is a really long time in the making. You've been kind of, well, you, you've you been writing them as poems for a long time, right? Yeah, the poems come real quick. The poems come as quickly as I can write them down. Yeah. Funny thing about any, I posted 550 poems of the day on Facebook in a row, 550 straight days. Oh, wow. I'd get up and I'd write a, often that morning I'd write a poem and post it on Facebook. And all my poems, they, they just come to me. I just write them down. I, what, what got I you into poetry, them. man? What, what got you into that? To be honest, Elton John, when I was in high school, I listened, loved Elton John. And I dated a girl that loved Elton John. And uh, Bernie Toplin, is that how you say his name? I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Bernie Toplin writes all the lyrics for Elton John. And I just liked the way he wrote. And then uh, when I got in the Air Force, I met a guy from uh, Colorado. We were in boot camp and uh, tech school together, and he encouraged me. He saw a few of my poems, and he encouraged me to keep at it. And then I got a great Harry Chapman story. You know Harry Chapman? Cats the, in the Cradle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, let's when, hear it. Well, when I was stationed in Germany, th this meeting ca taught me two things. Never give up, and never forget those who help you out. 
So when I was in Germany, I was stationed at, at my base, and Harry Chapin was coming to, t- to play on the base on a USO tour. And I had no idea who he was other than Cats in the Cradle and Taxi. I knew he was famous. I really didn't follow his music. I just knew he was famous, and I was writing, trying to write lyrics, and I thought, hey, if I can get into a famous guy, maybe he'll use some of my lyrics. Yeah. So I went over to the um, club manager and told him what I wanted to do, and he said, well, tell you what, I'll get you in to see Harry if you'll do me a favor. I said, well, what's that? He said, Harry can't get his band in from London because of customs. So he's going to perform solo, and he needs a guitar. You find me a guitar, I'll get you in to see Harry. So I went through the barracks, and I found, found him a guitar. And sure enough, after the show, the manager got me in to talk of Harry. And Harry spent about three hours with me going, I had brought 10, 10 pieces of poetry. And he went verse by verse, line by line. He goes, man, I like this line. I like this verse, but what the hell are you thinking of this verse? You know, you're completely in left field now. And he just went through the whole thing, all 10 poems, and really spent a lot of time. And he said, you've got talent. Don't ever give up. Look at me. I can barely sing. I'm a lousy guitar player, and look where I am. And he finished the meeting by saying, wherever I am in the world, if you happen to be there, come on down. I'll let you in for free. You watch the show. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. Thinking, thinking he's just bullshit, you know. Well, two years later, I was in uh, out st- stationed in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, this is two years later. In that two years, this man went all over the world playing concerts, meeting thousands, tens of thousands of people. The girl I was dating in Omaha just loved Harry Chapman. I said, hey, I know Harry. She goes, yeah, right. You know Harry <laughs> Chapman. <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. I said, no, no, let's go down the show. I'll prove it to you. So I went down to, uh, we went down to the venue, knocked on the back, the, the stage door, and a uh, roadie came out, and I told him the story about how I helped Harry out. He said, well, I don't know. Let me get, get his manager, who happened to be his brother. The manager came out, and I told him that story. I told him the story, and he goes, well, Harry is on his way in from the airport. You come in, you stand back here out of the way, and when he gets here, I'll ask him about it. Now, this was before cell phones. This was in 1980. So we're standing there. The stage manager's right there on the stage the whole time. He didn't make any phone calls. In walks Harry Chapman, and he takes a couple steps through the door, and he glances over, and he, he stops, and he looks at me again, took another step, and he stopped again, and he started walking over towards me, me and my girl there, and uh, he goes, I know you from somewhere. And I started to tell him, he said, no, 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 don't tell me. Wiesbaden, Germany, 1977. Rocker club, you got me a guitar so I could play a show, didn't you? And I thought, holy shit. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And that wow. taught me never forget the people who help you out. I yeah. mean, yeah. here's a guy that traveled the world. Two years later, he remembered somebody on a sm- real small Air Force base. Wow. Who had gotten him a guitar so he could play a show. Man, that speak to his, speaks to his character. Oh, he ton. was more. And for him, after the show, to sit there and actually go through, not just read and go, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. What, what else you got? He actually went line by line, verse by verse, said, this verse fits. I love where you're going with this. You're way out left field here and you're printing back here. You know. So did you end up actually taking any of his um, constructive, Oh yeah. I don't want to yeah. say criticism, but constructive criticism and yeah. implementing it in your Oh, course? yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I tried never to forget who helps me out. Yeah. I think a lot of people do forget yes, who do. helps them out. Especially, yeah, you know, they, sure. they, they start at the bottom, work their way to the top, yep. you know, get, get famous in acting or music or radio yep. or whatever. And they forget who the little people were. Yeah, absolutely. They get famous and they forget the, the little guys that are doing the podcast. that got them where they're going. <laughs> exactly, and, man. And like, I try never to, to forget that. Well, so. and I get it. I mean, it's, it is hard. Because you do get a little bit bigger and people, you know, they want to take advantage of you too, though. Well, the more people who know you, the more people are constantly kind of coming to you and needing yeah. things. And, and so you get, you get a little more burnt out, I think, the, the more people yeah. you know, well, the more people know you. And like we were discussing earlier off the air, I had a broadcast of my own for a while and I interviewed John McEwen of the Nitty Ready Dirt Band up in Park City. I love and them. this man, when he came in, he looked like he was dead. He had f- food poisoning or something, and he was so weak he could barely stand up. And I said, uh, hey, if you don't want to do this interview, I understand. He goes, nope, I told you I was going to do the interview. I'm going to do the interview. I don't believe in committing to something and backing out. If I'm alive, I'm doing whatever I say I'm going to do. 
he did that interview, just as sick as a dog, and about halfway through it, he started perking up and started feeling better. But, you know, once you commit to something, you should be there. Let's talk about that for a minute here and why you brought that up. Uh, so you kind of did a little bit of a radio show mm-hmm. uh, with with John Farmer, actually, yeah, John Farmer. Uh, yeah. a mutual friend of ours. Yeah. Was that – how long did you do that for? I did it for about, I think, four or five months. It was called Off the Written Page, showing how you take an idea off the paper and put it to the music, put it to the stage, put it to TV. The show is all about not the end product. It's, a lot of radio sta- stations will play the finished song. But I was telling this, my show was about how I got from the idea to the finished song. So we seldom played anyone's songs. You kind of talked about the creative process. The creative and everything. process, yeah. Yeah. Did you I, interview, I, was it strictly an interview show? Yeah, interview okay. show. And uh, I did it with actors and uh, actresses and songwriters. Uh, yeah. Like, was, so so you got process. quite a few interviews. Who, who were some of the people that you got to chat with? No, Tracy Nielsen. Uh, Drummer that's quite popular around town, yeah. Kurt Bester. Okay, yeah, Kurt Bester. Uh, yeah, Johnny Lightfoot. Yeah, uh, John McLuhan, uh, Sue Rowe, actress has got uh, uh, quite a following around town. Are there? Are these actually accessible anywhere? Are they still stored? It, on I'm any sure servers, John's or? got them somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah, okay. John. I don't know if anyone could, could look them up. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if John to. podcasted it all. I don't know. I don't think he, oh, okay. he saved him like that. That's one. That's one beautiful thing about I am Salt Lake here, Mike. Is mm-hmm. is all the six years of me doing this podcast? They are all still available in the, in the database. <laughs> well, no, I mean you can go right in uh, one spot. In one yeah. spot, either yeah. on the website yeah, that's cool. or uh, iTunes or Spotify. Even mm-hmm. you can listen to uh, all three hundred and. Whatever episodes. There's like 340, 40 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably yeah. three, four, three hundred. That's a lot. 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, quite a few you conversations. Guys, you know, 340 shows, that's a lot of work lining up 340 yeah. guests. Well, they're, they're really, well, I think you reached out to me. Though. Yeah, I reached well, out to I you. Mean, I, saw, I saw you on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've I, been. I reached out to you. I, you know, and it's funny because, I, and I said this to you, uh, I believe in the message. I was like, well, I've been meaning to bring you on anyway. But I do love it when people reach out. The only thing I tell people is be patient because sometimes I can't get you on right away. I only do one show a week right now. Yeah. Anyway, back to this, the music, the acting. If you could go back in time and do it all over again, what would you do different, if anything? I mean, I guess that's that's uh, a not, lot for a lot. A lot kind of like, uh, well, what's that Tim McCraw song? There's no sense in what might have been. So that's just wasted time. I'm just a person that believes everything you go through gets you where you are today. I wouldn't be the person I am today without, you know, I hated the Air Force, but I wouldn't have met Harry Chapman if it hadn't been for the Air Force. I wouldn't have met uh, some lifelong friends that I have to this day if it hadn't been for the Air Force. You know, I like to joke around and say, when people ask me why I joined the Air Force, I joke around and say, well, you know, I woke up one day and decided I wanted to live like a dog for four years. So I joined the Air <laughs> Force. But got a lot of great experiences out, out of the Air Force. There's uh, not much I'd change. What about I can't the- think anything right off the top of my head. What Other a- than a few of the people that I, I've hurt. Sure. You know, uh, as I look back on some of the stupid things I did in my, my youth, I, I'd change the ones that hurt people emotionally. Yeah. Other than that, uh, no, I'm pretty, I've had a good life. What, what about the future? I mean, where would you like to see this take you? Would you like to do more movies, create more, more albums? Well, actually, I've, I've got two things on my bucket list. Like I say, I've, I've done a lot. I've traveled a lot. I've met some of the finest people that, that you can meet anywhere. And the two things on my bucket list are getting this show out, the Father's Love Letters, either in a national tour format or in a Broadway show for, for man. So and so, that, so you're working on that. I mean, how, I wouldn't even know the first step on how to do that. I wouldn't that. either. I mean, well, you, the, you've... the hardest thing is finding uh, my wallets aren't too deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to find investors. That's the hardest thing. And then once you find interested investors, uh, you got to convince them you've got something. People with money. And you've already done one rendition of this at the Draper Amphitheater? Yeah, that was a baseline uh, baseline show. It's just a basic element, just a band. And I, I did have a lot of video for that show that was, was meant to be projected and tie pieces together. But unfortunately, it was daylight and you couldn't see the video. Oh, yeah. So I had a, a person come up from uh, Vegas to scout the show because they said they've got investors interested in it. And I told, told the person, all you're going to see is the baseline show. You're not going to see the bells and whistles here. Right. You're just seeing the basic performance. 
She said, oh, yeah, I understand, I understand. I go, okay, well, then come on up and see what you think. After seeing the show, she was highly critical of there not being anything else involved in the show. The fact <laughs> go, that there weren't special effects <laughs> yeah. or, yeah. I go, well, I told you that this is just a baseline show. Yeah. And it's like when you uh, do what's called a scra- scratch vocal when you're creating something, where you just lay down a, a guitar tr- a track or a piano track and you just... It's do a, a test scratch. Run. Yeah, test run. Yeah. People yeah, are listening to those. Even people in the business, you say, okay, this is just a scratch vocal or just a guitar. It's not the finished song. Yeah. And it's a surprise how many people have just critiqued the dog out of that thing. You so, know, it's oh, tough man. because when you do present something, especially a creative project to people, mm-hmm. and they know it's not the complete project, mm-hmm. they do come with a lot more feedback that they don't understand what kind of feedback you're looking for. Mm-hmm. So they come at you with, very random feedback or extremely yeah. detailed yeah. feedback that you already know. And so it's, it's really hard to set people's expectations when exactly. you want to show them something that exactly. you've made creatively. And that's why when people come to me with things, I have a good understanding of, of that concept. Yeah. And I'd say, I don't criticize, well, oh, it's not the end project. Well, of course it's not the end project. I told you that. I think I if, try to look to if what someone it could who be. is looking at someone's creative project like that, wants to give feedback, you should always ask the creator, what kind of feedback are you looking for yeah. before you say anything? Yeah, and you should understand sure. And you should understand what stage you're listening to. Right. Is this the first stage, which that scratch vocal is, or is it, has it been produced, halfway produced? You know, where are you yeah. in the process? Yeah. You can't just criticize the scratch vocal because it's not Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something. Yeah, it's just not there. So do you have a next step that you're taking this in? Like, do you have the next goal in mind that you're well, working I, on? I, I was able to get a uh, video done at the performance of uh, down in the Draper Amphitheater, and I put together a booking pr- promo. So I'm using that to try to book more shows, which is kind of a catch-22 because a show is so expensive. You know, my cost to produce one of my shows is $7,000. It's a good bit of money to me. Right, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it takes me a while to save that much money to do a show. And being a, as I am a relatively unknown artist, venues aren't too likely to pay $7,000 for a show. So whenever I do a show, I have to buy my way in at this point. And that's understandable. Who's going to risk $7,000 on an unknown artist that does spoken word? I, I understand that. I'm in a kind of a catch-22, like most artists are. You mm-hmm. know, got a great idea, just don't have the funding to do it. You know? right. Well, maybe somebody, one of our listeners, you know, yep. maybe yes. want to invest. In- if you want to invest in a, a potential Broadway show, get a hold of me. <laughs> Let me explain it. <laughs> so, Mike, on all the podcasts, I always bring up, like, favorite local eating spots in Salt Lake. But since you're in Park City, I want to mm-hmm. talk about Park City a little bit. Mm-hmm. Where I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Do you have any favorite places that you like to eat up in Park City? Like if somebody was visiting Park City, can you name one or two places that they should go uh, get oh, yeah, a bite I like, to eat? I like, if you like pizza, Maxwell's is a nice place. Oh, they got a Maxwell's up there in Park City? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's nice, relaxing. Uh, and Mod Pizza just came there, which is probably one of the best deals I've ever found. You get an 11-inch 11, 11 pizza for $8. That should get paid by Mod, shouldn't it? <laughs> but you get unlimited <laughs> toppings. Really? And it's just a fabulous place. Uh, let's see, where else? The Powder Restaurant, where I work. Uh, what kind of food is there at the Powder Restaurant? Oh, we have seafood, steaks, you know, typical uh, American cuisine. What keeps you in Park City, man, instead of coming down to Salt Lake City? For what? To live. To Like, I mean, what oh. keeps you up there, man? Like, it seems like it's kind of a ski town, right? Are you a yeah. big skier? Or? I haven't skied in probably 20 years, 25 years. But, but you still stay up there, huh? <laughs> I just like the mountains. Yeah. But, yeah, the, the air is a little cleaner up there. The air is cleaner. And I like the mountains. It's just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I it's beautiful here, too. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. man, I don't know if I'm supposed yeah, I'm to not, talk that way about Park City. I know. Park we can't city talk about Park City. On a, on a, on a Salt Lake City podcast. I'm not much of a city guy. Really? You like you know, The town I actually came from is just outside of Zanesville. Zanesville's got about 10,000 people. The, the ground town I grew up in I had 550 people. So I'm I'm a small town boy. Park City's <laughs> nice though, like that. You know, I got to get up there and spend some yeah. more time. What about yeah. Yeah. like s- other things? Do you, is there other things you like to do or to recommend? I, I like to use this podcast mm-hmm. as even uh, like a resource for people. Yeah, who resource come. people mm-hmm. tour. They travel here. What else yeah. would you tell them to check out? At oh, Park that's great. City? I'm a big motorcycle enthusiast, so there's great motorcycle riding up in the mountains. Uh, if you're a golfer, Park City's got the most 
golf courses per capita of any town in the country. Really? They have uh, outstanding golf courses. There's a lot of entertainment, uh, outdoor concerts, uh, concerts on Main Street. That's the thing about Utah. People don't realize there's a lot of talent, a lot of good music. In, yeah. In, there really is. In Utah. Yeah. There's a lot of talented people in Utah. It's kind of everywhere you go. And I think a lot of them get overlooked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do. Um, well, it's like Rich Wyman. He's one of the best performers I've ever seen. And it's funny. I've got a book in it. Speaking on, on this topic, uh, I've got a booking agent that I've known for years out of Chicago that has wanted to book me. I've just never been able to get him some video of me performing until now. And I always send them uh, Rich Wyman. I send them Kurt Bester stuff. I send them all these really talented musicians. And uh, he doesn't want to book those guys. And I go, my God, Jagertown? Come on. And Kurt Bester, you don't want to book these guys? Why? <laughs> he goes, well... You don't want to book these guys, but you want to book me. Why? He goes, why? Here's why. There's 10,000 singer-songwriters that play piano, 10,000 singer-songwriters that play guitar, 10,000 country bands, 10,000 jazz artists. There are a dime a dozen. The reason I want to book you is because what you do is so different. There's very few people out there doing what you do. One, it's spoken word. You don't have to be a vocalist like Elvis Presley to be able to do what you're doing. The common man on the street can speak. If you can speak, you can relate to what you're doing. So you're very relatable. You got a great message behind your CD and the music you got on there is fabulous. So gosh, yeah. that, that, he sold me. Yeah. yeah, I know. That's inspiring. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why he wants to try book me. So I finally, finally got a video to him and he's going to try to help me out. So he's so, been begging me for a long time. So have you had the opportunity to play outside of Utah at all? No, no, no. but soon. Well, no, I take soon, it, I take it, I take it back. I was on www.dbtv.com out of Vegas playing the track. Did a kind of a video sure. podcast. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I did that last May, I think. We're going to play one more song to close the podcast out, the final deal on the po- what What song are we going to end the whole podcast out on here? Let's end it with I Want You to Know. I what, think what, what, what's the name of it? I Want You to Know, the very last track. I Want You to Know, track number 13 on A Father's Love Letters, which uh, you could go to, what's the web address again? It's the Reverb. Do you, do you Rever- have- ReverbNation.com. Slash Mike Hamill. Slash Mike Hamill. And that's Hamill, H-A-M-I-L-L, two yes. L's, not one L, like yeah. the guy from like, Star it's, Wars. It's, right? it's Mike, not Mark. <laughs> he who shall not you be You know, it's named. funny. I mentioned that when you were going to come on the mm-hmm. podcast. Somebody's like, oh, I thought you were, said Mark Hamill. I was like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. But uh, anything else you want to ask him, Chrissy, before we let him go here or anything else that we didn't bring up, Mike, before we wrap this podcast up? I just want you to give us one piece of advice. If you could leave our listeners with one piece of life advice, what would it be? I think it's the advice that uh, Harry Chapman gave me that, or that I learned from Harry Chapman. Don't ever give up and uh, never forget those who try to help you out. I love it. Perfect place to end. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate you having me on. And I always tell people, let's catch up down the road. Absolutely. All right. Many thanks again to Mike Hamill for joining us on this episode of the podcast and sharing his story. You can head on over to our website, IamSaltLake.com slash 341 for all the links for you to get in touch with them. Go reach out to Mike and let him know you heard him on this podcast. Hey, it's the first of the month, guys. You know what that means. This is the time that we take a few moments, give some love to our Patreon supporters. These are some listeners or these are listeners of the podcast that uh, they, they go the extra mile and they become a Patreon supporter and they might give the podcast, you know, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month. It's like an ongoing Kickstarter. So we can help keep the lights on here. We can help pay the bills. We can help keep this podcast going. And so I just wanted to uh, run down the list of our awesome patrons. Uh, we have the very awesome John Miller, Ryan Prince, Brandy Burnham, the Ute Daddy Lawn Process. So there's a name for you. Uh, that's a brand new Patreon supporter. Thelma Rother, Elizabeth McIntyre, Three Irons SLC. They've been a long Patreon supporter. Uh, Nicole Davison, Alex Santi, Riley Padilla, Zach Shutt, Brandon Hill from Mountain Standard Time Marketing, Will Dugdale, 
Jared Aguilar, Brittany Hemingway, Jeff Hadfield, Michael Beck, Eric Tamaro, shout out to the mediocre show there, Jeff Hat, John and Nikki from New Zealand, and then we have Sana, TW, Alan Martindale, and uh, the very awesome Michelle Stevens William, Williams, Dirt in Your Skirt podcast, Christopher Heiser, and Jay Chambers. That, that is a that is a list, Chrissy. That's an awesome list of awesome people. I get goosebumps reading over that list. I mean, these are people that are like, your podcast is so badass that I want to support to it. You can become a Patreon supporter. Go to patreon.com slash I am Salt Lake. You'll see, I mean, we got rewards for as little as a dollar. Help keep the lights on. Help pay the bills. You guys have no idea how important it is to uh, to help keep this podcast going. So many thanks to our Patreon supporters. And I also want to thank again our sponsors for this episode of the podcast, the amazing Five Wives Vodka, the Salt Lake Barber Company, and Market Source Real Estate. And a big thank you to Access Coworking Space for their hospitality with our podcast studio. And most of all, many thanks to you, the listeners, for coming back episode after episode. Hey guys, you have a great week. Get out and enjoy the city. Maybe hit up the downtown farmer's market and we'll see you on the next episode. And good night, Grammy. I should die tomorrow. I just want you to know just how deeply you have touched my life and how much you mean to me. To have been able to hold you during your first breath. To have been able to watch you as you've grown for these nine years is the greatest thing I've ever done. fortunate in my life for I got to see you learn to crawl to walk to talk to brush your teeth even your hair I was there when you first two wheeled I was alive to hear you laugh so many times I was able to hold you when you cried I heard you read and learn to spell God so many more times for blessing me with you. I just want you to know that I'm proud to be your dad. And should a time come that I'm no longer here and you feel like you're alone and need a friend, I want you to remember.
there's no space, time, life or death that can separate us. I will always be your dad. No matter where I am, I will always try to do my best to help. And you, you must always try to do your best to treat others like you and to be yourself. Because you, just being you, made my life so worth living. Want you to know Want you to know Want you to know